Caught Offside with Andrew Gundling and J.J. Devaney. Oh, yes. Caught Offside. I'm just outside of New York City and from an apartment in Brooklyn, New York. Andrew Gundling, J.J. Devaney, an emergency pod. Eric Ten Hag is out. What's up, brother? Well, I thought he'd get a bit longer, but it's not a shock he's gone either. Uh, in fact, the leadership at Ineos at Manchester United have waited to do what they should have done in the summer. So basically, we're just, they're a couple of months behind what they should have done already. So yeah. That's where we are. I think of Eric Ten Hag's managerial stint at Manchester United as a game of Tetris. Yeah. And the pieces, you know, in the beginning, that first season, what, you know, he's cruising when the, when the pieces are coming down nice and slow. He's winning a league cup. This is easy. But then the pieces start to pick up speed a little bit. Ronaldo, <laughs> friction, tension. I want Ronaldo out. Pieces are coming a little faster. Start losing some games. Pieces are coming a little faster. Last season, off to the worst start, you know, one of the worst starts in club history. Now we're Now we're moving. Now we get to the end of the season, JJ. The board is full. But you have the one skinny log. Oh, if I can just get that damn skinny log, it'll save me. And sure enough, he wins the FA Cup. Oh, we're clearing the board. Oh, thank God, a stay of execution. My Tetris game can continue. But the pieces are still coming really fast once you get to that stage. And this season got off to a horrible start, the worst in club history. And here comes the little zigzag piece. Screwed. It's over. Eric Ten Hag is out. Yeah, I, th- I think that's very good. Um, I definitely think there was a cruising point in the first season. Uh, to continue your uh, Tetris analogy, yeah, keep I would going. say the f- the first zigzag or awkward piece that did not fit when you needed a skinny one was probably getting battered the week after. And I've said this before, the week after you get your first trophy, getting absolutely hammered. 7-0 by a Liverpool team that was struggling itself in that season. That was like, oh, wait. What we just did is good, right? It is good. And I think that was that was forgiven somewhat going into the following season. But things never, never really worked out. And, and again, I'll push on with the Tetris analogy. Every single signing was a zigzag signing. You know, again, to quote the sage, John Giles just keeps coming up, but he, he keeps saying, you know, or he has consistently said you can judge managers by the people they bring to the football club. And his have been spectacular failings. Spectacular failings. Uh, Lissandro Martinez being an exception, being that he is a good player, but not a player that can stay fit. Everybody else has been a disaster. And uh, buying players that you already knew uh, it never seems like a good transfer policy. I mean, Moyes got pilloried for doing the same or attempting to do the same thing on mass at Manchester United. No, his main one was to bring in um, Marouane Fellaini t- to to Manchester United. But but you know they that doesn't seem like forward thinking. But it was so. I kept thinking about Ten Hag's reign is kind of in keeping with Manchester United's reign. This reign of nostalgia that's kind of just like enveloped the club for years, like Sir Alex Ferguson. Never choosing his his successor uh, in David Moyes, um, you know, trying to inspire by bringing back Ronaldo, you know, a player that had left the club so many years previous, you know, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer leaving him in the job almost as kind of a relic of a bygone era. Ninety nine, remember ninety nine? That was great. Here's this guy. He was there. That kind of like rudderless thinking. And Ten Hag actually wasn't a break from that at all. Ten Hag was signed as Manchester United manager in 2022 based on a team he'd managed in 2019, the whole pandemic ago. Like, and then, you know, it was, it was clearly the IX 2019 team that, that thrilled us all. And then he embarks on his own nostalgia trip within the nostalgia trip by signing guys he knew uh, from that team, from that era. Uh, It was doomed to fail. It was doomed to fail for me uh, when I suppose 
I'm trying to think of the moment where I thought this, this cannot work. I mean, every weekend it was hard to see performances get better. It was hard to see the manager say we were improving. We're sticking to the plan. Um, I'm, tr I'm trying to think what, what was the point where, yeah, I think the point where I'm like, I was out on it anyway, but where I'm absolutely sure he should have gone was like the FA Cup semi-final against Coventry. Okay. Like that, and people will go, well, that seems very late. You, 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 you felt like it wasn't working before that, but that was the utter breaking point for me. I mean, to be seconds away and a pretty dodgy offside away from being out of that competition to Coventry. Um, even you, the fact, I, I mean, the fact they it, won it doesn't matter. If we went back and re-listened to pause, JJ, I think you had a come to Jesus moment with Ten Hag far before that. Yeah. But I felt like, it, yeah, I probably did. Yeah, I probably did. I felt like you I were very I, early in the... Uh... I, I felt he could have been, like, I had him on the hot seat the the August after he'd won the Carabao Cup, like going into the last season, the start of last season, because things had kind of drifted towards, after they won the Carabao Cup, they were bad, like really bad in the league. And I thought, oh man, is this, is everything we've seen beforehand real? And it wasn't real. None of it was real. Um, although I was very high on him, foolishly after winning the Carabao Cup. So why, why foolishly though? Like what, what up to that cause, point? Cause it would wasn't make you that, think that this wasn't real. It wasn't. They were good. playing great. They, they won a playing, trophy. They were playing fine, but it was, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't that, uh, not that it wasn't convincing because they were convincing against Newcastle. It was that it wasn't, I couldn't see, there was wins coming and there was in good individual performances within it, but I couldn't see a collective thing happening. And I never, and I've said this, so I'm, I'm just repeating myself. I could never see what he was trying to do. Like he would tell you and then you get worried. So the minute he kind of said, I want us to be the best counter-attacking team in the world, which was, the, he said that last preseason. That's when alarm bells really rang for me because that's not really what Ajax were. They were, I mean, they were good at every facet of it, but like they were good in possession. They moved the ball well. They, they great link up play. Um, and I was like, oh, is, that's that's Manchester United. That's what they're going to be. They're not. They're going to spend all this money and not, not be the dominant team in control of the ball most of the time. And then there was the performances. I mean, the end of last season. I'm on about Coventry, Crystal Palace away. Oh my God, a particularly bad beating. Um, Casemiro just everything just everything it was uh, it was a complete disaster and and now they have to now they have to try and fix it and uh, Rube Van Nistelrooy who I said would be manager before October was out is now manager interim manager of Manchester United so that may last all of 24 hours what are you hearing well Ruben Amorim um, of sporting is said to I mean, by the time you're listening to this, he may it may be official. But Guillaume so. Balague has a, a contrary thought. And he tweeted out that he believes uh Amarim is 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 more uh, anxious to hold off and to get City after Pep leaves because uh -huh. they think that might be imminent. Um Marco Silva has been spoken to. That's what Guillaume Balaguer said. Interesting. Okay. Well, I take it back. I guess only time no, will just Don't take it back. I mean, I take this, it all back. This is what's happening. Um, um, let just me just to, read. Let me read Guillaume's uh, tweet just so for posterity. This was tweeted an hour ago. I hear from Portugal a new possibility. Ruben Amorim might decide to wait for City if Pep leaves. leaves but United are pushing for a deal. And Marco Silva has been approached by Manchester United. Now that worries me straight away. Uh, United uh, um, United are pushing for a deal with Ruben Amor and, and and Marco Silva has been approached. Again, we're just we're firing bullets, and we're hoping we hit something. Well, but to do anything differently would be foolish. No, you have to speak to then to more than just one candidate. No, but if you don't like, get your top guy, you have to have a a, a plan B. Yeah, I know. I have no they, problem with that. Mm, That's smart business. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. And and I also think you're an all eggs in one basket kind of guy. No, I like it like a a a clear 
like maybe I need to do my research and that Ruben Amorim and Marco Silva play exactly the same style of football. I would doubt that, but maybe I need to look more at Amorim and he does the same the same things. Um, but like I just feel like that the the coaching hires, you know, that really stand out lately are the ones where, I mean, Klopp at Liverpool. Liverpool identified him and they got went and got him and made sure they had him. Um, I, I like I. And that just, that may very well happen with with Amarim. Yeah, and it seems like they've identified him as their guy. We'll we'll see what happens. Look, the ball's in his court. If he wants to wait for Manchester City, unless United are willing to break the bank to an obscene level to convince him otherwise, um, what can you really do? I don't know that did Liverpool have any strong contender for Klopp. Not to relitigate that hiring, but no, I mean, and there's like no that point. Was, but- it just uh, from the fans to the to the board to everybody, it was there was only one name, only one name. But I but I do remember the time when Klopp was the name that was being talked about to replace Arsene Wenger. That was actually people forget that was before Liverpool. The name <laughs> things could have been a lot different in North London. Uh, um, t- yeah. Can I just go back to your uh, to to everything you said about yeah. the Ten Hag era at United because I think it's. The more I, so since the news came out early this morning, which by the way just killed us, I would tell everyone still Gosh. go back and listen to our pod that we did Sunday night. Please, um, there's obviously a lot in there. El Clasico, Liverpool, Arsenal. We did talk about United and we did talk about Ten Hag's job. I said that this is it should be it. Um, so it's still worth listening to. But damn it, it would have been nice to have, to have had it. it yeah. in there. Along those lines, I should tell everyone um, if you're, you're listening to this pod right now on the regular feed. Obviously, our podcast yesterday was on the regular uh, the regular feed. We'll have another podcast later this week. That one will be behind the caught offside plus. Uh, that one is is with the plus side. Um, so, for those premium subscribers, uh, you'll find it over there. If you're not on the plus side yet, come on, people, get on over there. There's fun things happening. Um, so yeah, we'll have another pod for you later this week, but that one will be caught offside plus. Um, so I've been thinking all day about Ten Hogs. Rain at Manchester United. Rain is such a strong word. His time, he his reign. He ruled with an iron fist in moments. He did ask yeah. Ronaldo. Um, I find it so interesting because I do. You and I kind of we would fight a little bit over this over the last couple of years when we talk about Ten Hag. He, he was it was hard to pin down exactly what his time at this club was because there was. Like there was like an equal balance of both sides where you can make a decent argument for both things. Um, you know, for he wins the Carabao Cup. This is great. A week later, smashed by Liverpool, completely yeah. destroyed. You know, like then he'd have good moments in the Champions League. Remember Ronaldo going on the run scoring. Was that was that Ten Hag yet or was that still Ole? Well, either way, you know, then like you'd have moments of Wow, they look awful, Manchester United, but they are finding some ways to win. I mean, remember that stretch they went through, JJ, where like they were winning these games and were just like, I don't know how they're doing this, but they they continue to Scott McTominay scoring 90th minute winning goals every week. Like, mm. you know, so they're still putting up points, but are they playing well? Then last season, it gets really bad, and he's really on the hot seat. We're far enough removed now from his Carabao Cup win, where it's like, okay, well, that's over. And this is Manchester United, so we gotta are we moving forward or not? Doesn't feel like we're moving forward. And we just beat City to win the FA Cup. Yeah. And it's just like there was this constant counterbalance between these two things. Manchester United, they look like crap. Oh, well, their entire back line is injured. And the backups to the backups are injured. I there was always another thing that you could point to where you could did. where you could and he was and look, it is his job and his livelihood and his pride. He should. He I mean, he I don't blame him for that. Um, by the way, he was doing it right up until the end. Yeah, the the he what was his last press conference? VAR is ruined to be ending games like this. Oh well, Eric, what about your game against Tottenham? I don't count that game. What did he say? I deny that game. We I were deny wrong, it. We were wrongly given a red card. I deny that game. I don't think about that game. Biblical, right? wasn't it? Yeah, but like so there was always there was always like just enough of a thing that it made his time there really interesting and a really kind of a fun debate. You know, even like even go further into the statistics, his win percentage at Manchester United in all competitions since Ferguson left was second best only behind Mourinho. So you had that side. 
However, only David Moyes lost a higher percentage of his Premier League games at Manchester United than Eric Ten Hag. Like there was his whole in like all of it was just like this this crazy back and forth between is he good or is he terrible? And there it was hard to find a middle ground. Maybe in the end the middle ground is where he resided. Um but it was a very weird time and you know I guess I say all that to say like he should he should work again. Like I, I don't I'm not done with Eric Ten Hag. I think he can he can manage someplace else. You know, he did he have a raw deal at United? I mean I don't it was the one thing that I always kind of leaned on when I would when I would show back when I was kind of still supporting the guy and I wasn't ready to 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 sack him. Hmm. Like the next guy's going to come in whether it's Silva or Amarim or someone that we're not even talking about yet. Um and similarly to the Pochettino Bearhalter thing, we don't know how bad or how good these players are, but we have to bring in another manager that we think highly of so we can find out. Now, I don't know that I think do I have Amarim on Pochettino's level? I don't have Silva on Pochettino's level, but the truth remains, how many all these managers that Manchester United have brought in since Sir Alex Ferguson left, they're not all bad. They're not all bad. Okay, let's do this. So at a, at a right, well, hang on point, a second. These players these play are these players good enough? No. Uh, Is it all going to suddenly change tomorrow? No, but but like Andrew, you're, you're saying these things. Like Moyes was not suited to the job. The job was way too big for him, and it was he was a poor appointment. Although you can argue, he really should have been given longer. It wasn't enough time replacing a legend. Uh, Louis Van Gaal was signed, and he ended up playing the most like boring football ever. And Louis Van Gaal was signed after his peak years. They were over. They were gone. He was out in international pastures. Jose Mourinho was finished as a man manager, and we've seen since that he was not like you can't have Mourinho ball at a club like Manchester United. It doesn't work, and eventually that ended in acrimony. Uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer was not qualified; it was a nostalgia hire, and Eric Ten Hag was hired for something he'd done three years previous. So you know, I can tell so you those man. No, no, I can tell you they 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 are not. It's not. Don't don't look at it like that. Look at it in terms of a of a broader football operation that doesn't know what it's doing. Don't like you get players good, manager bad. Don't do it that way. Look at it. The overall plan was not there. There was no Michael Edwards. How much, however much plop fell out with him as well, or however much you want to criticize him, there was no like transfer committee. There was no anything. It was carnage, and that's how you end up with some of the players they have. Like if you look at everything that's happened at Arsenal. If you look at everything that's happened at Liverpool and you look at everything that's happened at, say, Brighton, it's a Brighton. There has been an overarching philosophy, a football development idea. How are we going to build a team? What are our principles? Let's get in managers that do that. At Manchester United, it was completely scattergun. How do you go from LVG to Mourinho? How? It's insanity. Um, and the next available thing, the next, they're, they almost remind me a little bit of how Tottenham were in the late 90s, early 2000s. Tottenham so easily be swayed by the soup du jour, the next big thing. There was no plan. And that's how they floundered. They go from a period of success with one manager, re decent success to like, all right, uh, what are we going to do? Martin Yall. Give Martin Yall the job. X player knows the club, blah, blah, blah. United are like that now. This is symptomatic of a rudderless football operation at the board level, Andrew. And that's the thing that needs to change. And that's what Man United fans will tell you. Eric Ten Hag and Mourinho and whoever you want, these are symptoms of a larger problem. They lost their way. And here's where we get back to. We get back to that, that fateful day in when, when Sir Alex Ferguson waved goodbye, was it against Swansea, and said, you, it's your job now to get behind our new manager. You know, we go back to that point. And what do we find? Um, you you listen to Mark Ogden talk about it. You listen to a lot of Man United fans talk about it. The man that led the club to the promised land and beyond also left the club in rag order in terms of how it was to be run going forward. It, there was no plan for a post-Fergie era. And it's 10 years of playing catch-up with that. And the similarities with Liverpool from like 1990 onwards are there to be seen. You know... Uh, nostalgia hires, ex-players, the boot room. Uh, and he, even down to this point, when Liverpool were 
floundering in the 90s compared to where they were, losing their way. There was a plethora of, of recent ex-Liverpool players in the media that were taking oh, shots. Jesus. That's exactly what's happening now with Manchester United. I mean, every week, probably one of the most watched football shows on YouTube is basically a nostalgia fest. Let's have Peter Schmeichel on. Let's have Roy Keane talk about how he fell out with Fergie. Like this constant cycle and, and skulls taking shots and Gary Neville being invited in to the to 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 discuss like what? Gary Neville is the owner of a League Two club. You know, he's an ex player, fair enough, but he's an influential media guy and he's been invited in because any of us are trying to bottle this storm. It's dysfunction. That's what it is. And it's showing out on the field week in, week out. Another point as well, I and I, I like it's not like a margin, which I, I genuinely get your your point about the roller coaster, the up and the down. And yeah, you know, United could have a good result on the two on like we'll say Saturday, and then they'd have Crystal Palace or Fulham the following Saturday, and you couldn't be guaranteed that they'd beat them. Sure. That's, no. You know, that that was definitely a part of it. But this is John McCall, a friend of mine who's like he's a he's a fireman and a big man United fan. And he texts me today, he goes, uh, they're so unwatchable. I haven't been going out of my way to watch the games. Like if I'm off and it's an early kickoff, I'm not giving them my time to lose. And then hear Eric Ten Hag say it's not about the result. And that's the other thing as well, I think, we haven't really touched on yet. Um, we had Wenger on the podcast a few years ago. How long does it take to get a culture in? He says if it's not in after what, like, so like Three two months. months. Two months. It's not happening. I would say apply, change the word culture to style of play. I mean, we didn't have to wait for Ange Ball to start. I, is it refined? Is it perfect? No. No. Certainly not. But you knew what it looked like. And, you know, Ten Hag's been beating the drum about, and rightly so in some cases, about injuries. Uh, but we haven't got the players together. We stick to the plan. We stick to the plan. I need to, like, I should be able to see the plan at this point. And I'm not, and that's why he's gone. Yeah. I mean, there's no progress. Um, and look, for Manchester United to to undergo an, a, a I, I, I guess I can't say exhaustive search, but to undergo a, a managerial search over the summer only to come back to this guy. I mean, let's all be honest here. He was managing under probation. Like, this was mm. a probationary period. Yeah. For, and if you get, like, Okay, if you got off to a, a hot start here and showed them something, you guess what? You get to continue. Um, but instead, they got off to the worst starting club history in the Premier League. They're 14th in the table. All right? I mean, you know, you can talk about the personnel that they have all you want. 14th is inexcusable. And it's a sign that not only is progress not being made, they were going backward. So I can sit here and say, I don't know that this is going to get better with a new manager. But I also can sit here and say, this had to happen. This, I, I wouldn't, you know, we always do our... Was this fair? This is fair. I, I don't. I wouldn't no. sit here and say that this was an unfair decision to to let him go. He he got plenty of time and plenty of money, as as you should at Manchester United. Sure, one hundred percent. If you hire a manager, you back him. But like again, the the big signings you thought that have to work and come in and make an impact didn't. I mean, Anthony has been a. It's one of the worst signings in Premier League history. Yeah, you would say that has to be. It has to be. So um those things just they accumulate and they're gonna they're gonna hurt you. And um Ten Hag is you know, he has handled himself with a lot of what would you say, stoic Dutch dignity. You know, but I think week in, week out being asked about your job, I think he'll feel uh, sad for a while, but also I think this might be a happy release to him. This is a mercy killing. Oh, I think so. I think <laughs> so. Cause, oh my God, like it. And again, I do, I do side with you as well. There's like player responsibility. Like there's, there, they were so bad after ruining. And I, I'll have, I'll, I'll give this to them. They ruined the end of Liverpool season last season, both in the cup and the league. They, they really did. When we're talking about marquee moments, I'd put that above any Carabao no, Cup. But not the that's not bigger than the FA Cup. It's bigger than the Carabao Cup. Uh, oh, I think I think you have a very high. Was it Co was it Kobe Manu's winner in the FA Cup? Uh, there's a few people on the Stratford in front of the Stratford end. I can't remember. Was it him? Was it Manu that scored? Um, on St Patrick's Day, I think. 
there's a few people in the Stratford end, and they'll be holding that memory to their heart for a as long they long should. Time, as they should, um, but you know, though, apart from that, I mean, no, it is the it's one again though. It's one of the weird contradictions of his time there. Won two trophies, yeah, and, and in one of them they beat Manchester City to win it. Yeah, yeah, it's it, the whole thing was weird. It is Very weird. Weird couple of years. My, I have a question for you. Rank, like it, it, this is the big the thing that any of us will be judged on. I mean, they can do all they want about like curbing overtime for people and making sure people don't work from home. You know, demanding that they come into the office. They can all do all that little kind of performative stuff, but they'll be ranked on what happens on the field ultimately, because they've been given the keys by the Glazers to the football operation. Like this, if you're a Man United fan, this fills you with dread. This start that they've made. Uh, like this is their first major error now. This because this is not just Ayrton Hag getting sacked. This is the organization putting their hands up and saying, "Yeah, we uh, we couldn't get it done in the summer. We couldn't find anything, and now we're doing it at the end of October." It's a good point. It's this was not just a in, in like I, when I talk about Ten Hag's probationary period, that was for his job. This new ownership group, it's sort of a probationary period in in the eyes of the fans how yeah. Manchester United supporters will perceive you. Well, the, at your first big moment, now again, they did win the FA Cup. Um, I, you can't just forget that that happened. Um, but from an ownership standpoint, yeah. you know, a managerial decision-making, um, yeah, this was this was a, a big whiff uh, in yeah, terms of huge. bringing him back, giving him a, a decent amount of money to make more signings and only to then let him go this quickly into the season. Now, again, letting him go this quickly into the season is, is I think rectifying a mistake that they made. I'm not, I'm not faulting them for this, but this whole, this whole thing is, is kind of messy. And, and if, and if Ineos coming in was supposed to change that perception from what, from what the Glazer era was, well, we're not off to a good start. It kind of, there's a little bit of a meet the new boss, same as the old boss feel to it. Yeah. I think as well, there's a, there's something that needs to be, you know, we, we talk about signings. Like, we can do the same thing with uh, with with Manchester United, you know? Um, you know, like, in terms of the board and, and in terms of the new Ineos and the, the owners. Like, they've given a lot of people a lot of jobs. So... They've brought in Manchester City Football Operations Officer Omar Barada. Uh, he's the new CEO. Jason Wilcox, who they headhunted as technical director. Um, Dan Ashworth, the sporting director. Dan Ashworth had to go on, what was it, like gardening leave from Newcastle to get, you know, they really pulled out all the stops to get him. Uh, Christopher Vivelle as head of recruitment. Um, you know, Ruud van Nistelrooy, uh, is 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 an Ineos sign in as well, which was it seems like now in hindsight like something that they they put in place. Well, I if was we reading. Need, go uh, on. I know that's the perception of it, but I I think it was Ben Jacobs. Um, I'll see if I can find the tweet, but I was reading about that a little bit, and it sounds like that was driven by Ten Hag to bring in Ben Nisselroy. Yeah, now, that was not necessarily Manchester United planting a a quote unquote Trojan horse um, to to be there. From... I mean, it works out for them perfectly because they have a guy who has, at least has some decent, not much, but a little bit of senior football coaching experience with PSV, a former legend. So who, to come in for interim, um, yeah, the day, the no, day... you win the press conference, but yeah, yeah th it's... this is what Ben Jacobs wrote about it. He said, Ruud van Nistelrooy was a hire driven by Ten Hag rather than Trojan horsed in to replace him. Van Nistelrooy has had multiple one-on-ones with senior leadership at the club and impressed them. Interim role, something spoken about internally at the club as early as September, despite Van Nistelrooy being loyal to Ten Hag. See, see, but that's what I'm talking about. They probably were like, you want to bring in who? Absolutely, because that'll suit us, buddy. <laughs> that suits us down to the ground. This makes us look like genius geniuses. The minute you said impress the 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 ownership group like that, that it's so empty to me, so empty. Of course, he's he'll impress you. He's Rude Van Nistelrooy. He scored ninety five goals for the club. He was at one point the record goal scorer in Europe. 
He's a club legend. You don't, yeah. you can't lose with this one. The danger is that he will win. And then you end up in, because I, like, is there a strong enough voice in, in, in amongst Barada and uh, uh, Wilcox and Vivelle and all these guys to say, if this guy starts winning, he still doesn't get the job because you are going back down a road you've been down already and it didn't end well with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. So they just need to break out of this debt spiral that they're in of nostalgia and dysfunction. Well, it, what you say there is a, it's a really interesting point. It's kind of why they need to hire someone quickly. Yeah, that's true too. And But, but then again... Don't, because, part- because if Van Nisselrooy comes in and wins... And then, okay, let's say that they do have the backbone. No offense to Van Nisselrooy, he might go on to be a great manager, but it feels like an appointment that maybe United are, are a little big for. Uh, he, I know he managed PSV for a season, um, but I don't know. I, I, I kind of want somebody with more of a resume. Um, so let's say Van Nisselrooy comes in, there's a new manager bounce. Maybe the players like him. Like you said, he's a club legend and they're winning games, but they have the backbone to say, yeah, but you're not it. And so... Then they go out and they hire the big name. Now there's even more pressure on that guy because the guy that the fans love, he was here for a month and he won. And so now whoever comes in that you have back, that you have put a lot of money behind, now that guy better win because if he doesn't get off to a good start, he'll lose the fans immediately. They'll be chair- they'll be singing Rude Van Nisselrooy's name in the stands. Yeah. They got to make so a hire true. quickly. Yeah, and he, you do make a good point there. And it just... I wonder is... It, it's it's just in my brain, like, it can't be a steady the ship higher. It's got to be a, a higher, like, I, do you know what I mean? Like, have they, have they, can they identify a guy that's going to go in and do three or four years and turn this around? Or two years and turn it around? It, and I don't know, like, when I see Marco Silva, I mean, well, Amarim is a, look, I'll go back on what I said earlier. I mean, Klopp was brought in in, what was it, October. So it was the season that already started under Brendan Rodgers. By the way, it, do, do United have patience here also? they're Again, they're 14th right now, and they, lo- and they look every bit of it. I don't know that this is an overnight fix. Like I said, I don't know that their team is that good. So like even when Klopp came in, it wasn't instantaneous. Mikel Arteta at Arsenal. He was almost, I mean, he, he, you talk about a hot seat. So whoever this next guy is, they're inheriting a bit of a mess with a lot of recently signed players that are not their own. This will not get fixed overnight. And I'm wondering, do the fans who have been patient, say what you want about Manchester United fans, they have been patient. They're not used to having to wait this long to win. It's been a decade now. Um, Are they patient? Will any of us be patient? Or will they be looking to make up for whatever this mess is that they feel like they've maybe made with, with this Ten Hag situation? I mean, it's going to, whoever they hire, I think you need a couple of years before you can accurately judge this. Yeah, it's a rebuild. It's a complete it does, rebuild. It does feel like that. It because, does feel like that. Because, like, there's no guarantee that the new manager comes in and he sees Delict and he sees Casemiro and he suddenly gets a tune out of them. Well, and Delict, that, I think, is, he would be one of the players, if you ask me to identify, okay, who are the guys that Manchester United can, can feel decent about moving forward? Who are our, like the rest of the squad? Be damned! But what what is our core right now? I think Menu, Garnacho, Delict would be on my list. Um, let's see who am I? Who am I not thinking of? I don't know that I'm there with Rasmus Hoyland. No, um, uh, another another one of the ones that Ten Hag needed to get that right. He needed to get a center forward. Remember, I said to you, and again, I'm not doing. I told you so. But remember, I said he needs. He needs to be good or decent, even though he's young from the start. And it's been it's been bad and there's been injuries too as well. Uh Kobe Manu, um Bernard um Bruno, Bruno. Fernandes. I mean, he's been so key for them. Can can you think of what this last few years would have been like without him? But you can also see how he hasn't been good lately and he's caught a, a frustrated figure. Um Garnacho, obviously, did I say him already? Yeah, we said, I mean, like, there's not very many. I no. mean, you, you look, I mean, you look up and down the squad. I guess I would, I would, if you go forward with Delict and Lissandra Martinez as your center back pairing, and if they can stay healthy, I, I, I think that that's solid. Um, Fullbacks need addressing. Yeah, Diogo Dallo is, is a weird one. 
I thought he was, he, I thought he was actually one of the better performers last season. Yeah, I know. Um, but do you, is he your guy moving forward? Uh, you know, like, there's some that you know, like. Uh, we talk about their center, but like I, it, Lenny Yoro, we haven't even seen yet. That no, was he, supposed to be a significant move. Came in, got know, injured. Marcus Rashford, I think. If he moved on to a different club, I think that might be for the best. Um, but other guy, you know, Xerxy, like you, haven't really seen it yet. It's been not a long time to judge, but, you know, Ugarte, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of guys on that squad that if they left tomorrow, I don't think anybody would be shedding many tears. Yeah. Uh, so whoever comes in next is walking into it, a project. It feels like that's a project, and I know United fans don't want to hear that, and maybe they'll get mad at us for saying it because they don't want to believe that that's true because they feel like they probably sat through enough of these rebuilds over the last decade. But look at your club right now, and then look at you know look at the clubs that you think you should be competing with. I mean, come on, there's a there is a gap, there's a gap here. Um, yeah, it's a tough. This is going to be a tough a tough transition. I think that it, it will get better. I don't think this club is finishing 14th in the table this season. So I do, I do see that this, this will turn. Um, but I don't know. I, this will not, this will not be easy. This will not be an easy couple of years. I think for Manchester United, maybe we'll eat our words. Who knows? I guess only, only time will tell. Um, JJ, I was wondering just in a, in a grand, like a grander scope, since we started this podcast back in 20, April of 2014, now I don't have the list in front of me, but just off the top of your head, what are the biggest managerial firings you think? Like the ones that like when we saw it, you were most like, oh my God, emergency pod. Come on, get to the studio right now. Uh, Pochettino at Spurs was one. So I meant to tell you, I think I have told you for a long time. And eventually we got to a level where we were passing it, but to go to peel back the curtain for a lot of the animals out there listening for a while, when I would go check every once in a while, I don't do it often, but I'll sometimes check the metrics of like, okay, what, what's our listenership? How's it doing? The Pochettino emergency podcast uh, of when he got fired by Tottenham for a long time was our most listened to episode. Crazy, crazy, crazy time. Yeah. We were doing wild numbers then. Like, oh my God. Unbelievable. Um, That one. Uh, Mourinho. Take your pick. Which yeah. one was bigger, United or Chelsea? The Chelsea one, I think, was coming, and we could see it coming, but I think it was probably bigger. Um, then the United. Can I trying to remember the end of Wenger? And what I, that, that was, was again? That, that felt also like a had long, a that also had a mercy slow. killing feel to it. Yeah, that felt like it had a long, slow death. It wasn't a firing, but if we're talking about managerial news. I mean, even the the Klopp one from just a few months from last year, that was pretty that, shocking. That was shocking. That was massive. Uh, he was tired, very tired. Oh. Now he now he'll get to sleep on those jets. Resentment building. <laughs> no, um, you won't allow yourself. Other man. ones that were. I mean, we did like the Ranieri one wasn't a shock, but That's it was because it came so quick after the. It Premier was highly League. debated. I remember that was a yeah. big one. Yeah. Um. God, yeah. I'm trying to think of Brendan Rodgers. Definitely. Uh. Was it a huge shock? Probably not. But, um, it was to Thierry Henry when he grabbed Carragher's knee in the studio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did not grab your knee. I've no. never, I've never touched your knees. Actually, is that true? I don't know. No, well, for we'll any back, reason, we'll check the tape. Uh, so yeah, that's what those are the ones you're kind of talking about. Um, this is not this one's not on. I don't not think that this is... it's not on that list. And also, I think United again by by the basis of the last ten years, you know, a United manager moving on eventually, it's not not that shocking anymore. Uh, you've had you had like twenty six years of one guy. Um, everybody else is going to be kind of in the shadows. Uh, in terms of like the shock value, the shock factor. So um, yeah, those, those, those are the ones. Um, I mean, we can talk. There's been unfair sackings. I'm sure we could go through those where you're like, but God, I thought he was doing okay. Um, 
But no, it's uh, it's not that. And it's yeah. again, it's a level of where the club are at. Yeah. Um. So to kind of start to wrap this up a little bit, uh, now they look ahead. Like we said, we talked about Amarim. Um, you mentioned Marco Silva. I saw Thomas Frank, who's a, a manager that I really think highly of. And I think what he's doing right now at Brentford is pretty extraordinary. Um, you know, that that's another name that was mentioned. And Thomas Frank was asked about it. I mean, um, and it was kind of, un, it was a little bit uncomfortable because, and I sort of respect Thomas Frank for it. You could tell he doesn't, he doesn't want to lie, which I think is a good thing. Um, but it made for a little bit of an uncomfortable answer because Brentford are playing well right now. Yeah. Um, but you could tell, I, 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 I don't know, maybe I'm looking too deeply into his answer, but it felt to me in listening to what he said that this is a guy who is interested. Definitely. Who is interested and, and he probably feels bad. He's, is he the longest tenured manager right now with one club? It, it could be. Yeah. I mean, so he's been at Brentford for a while and he's Let's got not go through all the clubs, but if I had a quick scan of them, let me do a scan in my brain. He's, Hold on, and then I'll tell you. Hold on, I'll pull up the Premier League table. You you keep talking. I'll there, keep Andy. talking. But, you know, I mean, you heard his answer, and, and he, the, the person asking the question understood that this was delicate. And they even said, Thomas, we understand this is a, a fragile, delicate question, but we feel that it needs to be asked. Um, it's between him and Pep, surely, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't... I'd have to look up Thomas Frank to know when when that when his time there started but yeah he's got to be he's got to be one of the probably three most tenured yeah with one club um but thomas frank said he's like yes that is a delicate question and he wouldn't say no he he wouldn't lie he wouldn't say no and i think that would be i i, I really wow. think highly of him he's there from 2018 so all right so likely less than pep yeah G- Again, I think that would I think that would be a good hire. I think so too. Um, Can I say why it wouldn't be? Just quickly. Do you need someone with big club experience? I mean, he just doesn't have it. Brom Bromby and 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 Brentford. Um again, no, please, please don't roll your eyes, but Brentford are were are and continue to be incredibly well run. Like th- this is a an overall like exactly what I was talking about. There are people who have decided this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to play, and this is this is our 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 path. And that's why Thomas Frank is there. Like, can you take Thomas Frank from that environment of kind of? And I'm not again. I'm not saying it's there's no room for creativity or for him to be on his own and, and do his own thing as a manager. I'm sure there is. But a club that's so well run and has so so many clear ideas about what it wants to do and implements them and has a system, can you take a manager from that and then throw him into to this? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, so what does this mean then? No one can succeed. There. No, like, no, you're no, but maybe you need a guy who's kind of he's got a cool brain and hot feet. He can adjust very quickly. Because I think the thing that needs to happen now is that the wheels need to get in motion. Like, what does Jason Wilcox want to do? What does he's the technical director? Like, what does what's his plan here? What 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 does Dan Ashworth want to do? These are the intangibles here. Like, do have they sat down? And put it together. That's the question. And if so, they'll have a model of a manager and they'll need to go for him. Is Thomas Frank that guy? I, you know, the more you said his, you just said his name and he popped in and uh, someone tweeted today, a respectable journalist who, whose name does escape me, but that he reckoned Thomas Frank had the personality for the job. Uh, so, yeah, well, he's he doesn't cut a dour figure in the way that Ten Hag did, and I think it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world for a a a, po- a man of positivity who yes. I don't know. Just I, I feel like that that's the next. I I would look for someone who maybe could go that route. Um, just kind of sends a I don't know a more upbeat message. Um, about what what it is to be Manchester United. I would like look if they hired Thomas Frank. I get what you're saying. I understand your reservations, but uh, ultimately, I, I would say that that's a good signing. That's a good hire. Um, so we'll see. Uh, we maybe we'll know soon. 
Um, uh, yeah. And and if we do, we'll we'll cover it on our plus pod later this week. Before we get out, JJ, um, I saw one of the animals' father of Coco um, posted a chart of all of the managers uh, that have been fired by Manchester United, right? Since Sir Alex, and it's a chart that um, shows who has been thanked, wished well. Welcome, oh, excellent. Welcomed back. So only one of the Manchester United managers who have been fired since Sir Alex has been thanked in the club statement, has been thanked, wished well for the future, and welcomed back to Old Trafford. Can you guess who that was? Louis Van Hal. No. <gasps> this should be obvious. Jose Mourinho. No, God no. Oh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Of course. Yeah. Of course. They have to make. He's a club legend. He's responsible for one of the greatest moments in Manchester United's history. They have to maintain positive yeah. relations with this man. They just he's an important part of their history. Can uh, I? Yes. Can I also get a check in? Because yesterday's podcast was. Um, this is off topic. Are, are we done with United now and Ten Hag? Never. <laughs> no. No. Um, no. Go the on. only thing I was going to say is that yeah, uh, Ten. So if, if looking at this chart, Ten Hag was thanked. He was wished well for the future. They did mention his trophies, uh, but he was not. He is not welcome back at Old Trafford. Oh. Very few of them are. So Oli was the only one welcome back. The rest, they'll have to pay for a ticket just like you and me. Uh, yeah. That's, that, that suggests there's a very clear pattern. <laughs> I mean, like what they did to Van Hal. The stories like that he was down in like that Wayne Rooney says that he was down in the locker room afterwards celebrating the FA Cup after they won the FA Cup and he knew he'd been fired. And he was trying to celebrate and like that, that was cruel. And also to a man of his standing. And I, like I know they were hard to watch under him, but you know, they got a second place finish at one point. It, yeah, and no. he said, Yes, we are we very for, close. We go for second place. Um red wine. LVG is my favorite LVG. Oh, he was just in all his glory that night. He was. Um, the animals do have a, a Reddit thread going about the Ten Hag fire. Uh, Humanist96 says, you feel for him. You feel for him. <laughs> yeah. Um, Hello, I am a narwhal. JJ was quick to point out. He says, unfortunate. Edit. Also, this is for JJ, but Gary was not the first to be sacked. <laughs> yeah, so Boy, you got yeah. close. Yeah. Although, again, I will we'll say. We'll see. I, pred I predicted. I predicted exactly what's happened to Ten Hag. Like I'll, I'll get no credit. I'll I think if no people credit. went back and listened to our our season preview, the way we talked about Ten Hag, I think I think the things we said aged very well. Yeah, very well. But if it's and, obvious to us, I'd like to think that Dave Brailsford, uh, Sir nope. Big Jim. No, we're, we're smarter. <laughs> we are definitely smarter. Uh, okay, can I give another animal? This is from yesterday's podcast, and uh, by way of telling people that you should go listen to it. Like, it, it was fun. Yesterday's podcast was fun. Mm -hmm. I compared Thomas Party to a famous episode of Friends. Well, you compared him to that, but uh, it was all part of a wonderful analogy that I weaved together, and, oh, everyone loved it. It was like so, watching Da Vinci paint. Yeah, except this, it was a stuttering Irishman. So go back go back and listen to yesterday's podcast as well as this one. Um, so we did talk about... Um, we got into, how did we get into it again? Oh, I compared Luka Modric to Kevin Spacey in Margin Call, which was one of a plethora of films that came out a couple of years after the financial collapse of 2008. My, my mate Phil, who's an animal, like he loves the podcast. He's also a very intelligent guy uh, and he's very good in this area. We should give him all our money and ask him what to do with it, Andrew. Uh, and when I say all of our money, the $15 we have between us. Hey, you got to start uh, somewhere. It's either yeah. that or I'm going to the roulette tables in Atlantic City. So so Phil just texted me there, actually. And so we didn't know what shorting a stock is. Right. So shorting a stock. is. Are you going to read this whole thing? I saw this on the not, Reddit thread. It's like 10 no, pages. No, Phil texted me oh, via okay. phone. So, an, very, animal, an animal did post it. Yeah, I know. It's very readable, though. Shorting a stock is buying an insurance contract against against the stock. You are issued a, prom, a promissory note to a market maker to buy the stock at today's market value when you exit your short option. Short options always come with a date when you choose to exit the option. So if the stock is trading at a value lower than when you entered into the contract, you buy the stock at that market value and sell it to the market 
maker and earn a profit. If the stock goes up, then you have to buy the stock at the higher value and sell it to the market maker for the same price as your promissory note for a loss. That doesn't make it any clearer. Does What's it? that? A, a butterfly flew in the room. I, I've been chasing right. it around for the last. And his final, his final sentence or his final text was, "It is also all fugazi, just like I said. Like it's <laughs> just made up. These people, they get away with everything. Like, um, like, what did Ben Bernanke essentially do in 2008 to fix the 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 crisis? Didn't he? Just, I don't know. I think they're relying print, on all of us not knowing. Didn't the Fed just print more money? I think that's what they did. Again, financial people tell me that they just print more money. But isn't that inflation? Isn't that what causes inflation to happen? <laughs> no. I think if we, if one night we decided, you know what, let's do a, a plus pod. Let's drink 10 beers and talk oh. finance. I think it oh. would be. <laughs> oh, my God. Jesus. Um, I mean, oh my JJ, God, I got my nothing head. else. I got nothing else. We're going to get out of this one. Uh, we'll have a plus pod for you later this week where... Um, I do want to talk. The Ballon d'Or was handed out tonight, and it was pretty. Got to say, I thought it was pretty stunning. These things are not usually shocking. We did we, Real Madrid I, show up? No. Ah, uh, that's poor form. No, Rodri won the Ballon d'Or kind of against the odds. It seemed that this was a lock for Vinicius, um, and I find it really interesting that he didn't win. I kind of want to. We'll talk about it later this week on the Plus Pod because yeah, we we'll get uh, into it. Yeah, we're kind of exiting an era where it's just like the Ballon d'Or is just a foregone conclusion and it wasn't that interesting. We're moving into an era now where it's it actually is compelling and interesting to me. Um, so, yeah, Vinicius not getting it. Real Madrid showing a show of solidarity and not showing up. Rodri getting it while he's out with a torn ACL. Um, you know, once, I don't know, just wasn't wasn't what I expected. In my head, I was like, yeah, Vinicius is going to be the Ballon d'Or winner. Good for him. Um yeah, pretty interesting. So we'll talk about that later this week. MLS postseason continues to roll along, so we'll have some results from that. And we'll see what Manchester United do in the next 48 hours or so um, because something tells me I, I think they're going to move quickly here. I do. I don't yeah. think that they want a lengthy period of, of an interim where Ruud van Nistelrooy could gain some real goodwill with the fan base and make this whole thing even more uncomfortable than it already is. Yeah, JJ, listen, got it, you got they, anything they, else? They, they got a route for Ruud to be just good enough but not too good. Kind of. Oh kind of. Um, JJ, that's all I got. I enjoyed this. Um, I'm sorry to the Manchester United fans out there. Maybe this is a good night for you guys. Maybe it's just a sign of an, of what's become a really kind of bleak era. I don't know. I'd love to hear from United supporters on how they're feeling right now. Is this a sign of hope? Um, are they celebrating this or is it just, eh, whatever, wake me up when we're good again? I don't know. I'm, I'm really curious. Uh, so to chime in on the, the caught offside Reddit page, the discord page, um, obviously you can get us on Twitter at CO soccer pod at JJ Devaney at a gunling. Uh, on Instagram, caught offside pod everywhere. We're everywhere, JJ. Um, yeah. I got nothing, nothing left. Yeah. I got nothing left, my friend. Hey, to you, no. I say we are very close. Check I'll you later, you. fun boy. You've been listening to the Caught Offside Soccer Podcast. 